So, I have a confession to make. I love zombies. Zombie films, games, comics, even the mere concept of zombies is amazing to me. The undead coming back to life and becoming feral beasts? Oh, that is amazing. Something that was once human turning into a monster that wants to rip you apart, it sends shivers down your spine at the mere concept. But there's a bit of a problem. Zombies are stupid and slow. No, it, it's not that. It's that nowadays, zombies are kinda tired, and will often take a backseat to the media they're in, and will often be used as a set dressing. Probably the worst offender of this is The Last of Us 2. Geronimo! <laughs> While the infected are still in the game, and the Rat King is actually a pretty cool concept, they take a backseat to the human drama. And I don't know about you, but whenever I play a zombie game, I kinda wanna fight zombies. It's part of the reason why Resident Evil games, even the latest non-remake entries like Seven and the one with the big, tall-chested vampire lady, Anna, Anna. while are fun, they don't scratch that itch of me wanting to deal with zombies. Hell, the mold creatures from Seven, are they even actually zombies at all? They're made from dead people and mold, but... Bye, have a great time! It doesn't have the same charm, which is why I really appreciate the remake of Resident Evil 2. It brought back the actual zombies. There's a lot wrong with zombie media today, so it makes it hard for me to call myself a fan of it. And don't get me started on Resident Evil 3's remake. Ugh! Why do they give Nemesis a nose? That being said, this video is talking about my favorite series of zombie media, and how it was brutally murdered! Day one. The day I came here was the worst day of my life. I'll admit it, it was a big mistake. I've covered wars, you know. Zombies? Hard to imagine that 16 years ago, we would be first introduced to this series created by Keiji Inafune, one of the minds behind Mega Man and... That piece of garbage. Mighty number nine. Like an anime fan on Prom Night. Prom Night. And when we first caught a glimpse of this game, it looked completely different. The graphics weren't all polished, and the main character, Frank West, wasn't voiced by TJ Rotolo. And that's fair, it was beta footage. It wasn't really something to fully expect from the final product. But one year later... Something is horribly wrong in the small town of Willamette. I'm sorry, but what was that? Willamette. Willamette, Colorado. Willamette. What in the world? We finally saw what the game looked like, as well as what you could do with it. And let me tell you, it's... The game was quite colorful, a stark contrast to what you have been dealing with with zombie games. It made The Walking Dead pop out more. The background was a wonderful playground, a mall. A large mall filled with the brim with many fun things that you could use as weapons. Hell, you could even use the health recovery items as throwables if you wanted. Chainsaws, bats, hockey pucks, umbrellas. Hell, you could use zombies themselves as weapons. You could rip their heads off, swing them around. And make sure you treat people with respect on Twitter. To put it simply, there's a lot you can do in this game, and it gave you so many options. Hell, you could mix food and beverages to get boosts. You could hold on to books that would give you boosts to your weapons. You can throw pies at zombies! Who doesn't want that? Oh fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Sure, there were some issues with the game. It was a little clunky with the controls, and you couldn't move while you were doing focused aim, and survivors were the dumbest AI in the world. And that's saying something because the zombie AI in the game is actually pretty cool. You can even distract zombies with a hunk of meat. Oh yeah, survivors, um, yeah. The thing is about this game, it has a lot of, uh, escort missions in it. Yeah. And if you got a survivor stuck in the water areas, <laughs> they're dead. <laughs> they can't get out of there. I don't know why, but there was something wrong with GAY WATER! But hey, we're talking about a game that came out nearly 15 years ago. 
I think we can give it some leeway, especially when it comes to the graphics. Now, it's not a bad looking game, but it certainly has shown its age. I think what's the best part of the game is the bosses, the psychopaths. Unlike other zombie games like the also Capcom owned Resident Evil, the bosses were regular people who weren't turned into zombies or giant monsters. They were people who broke down from the psychological terrors of the zombie invasion, like Adam the Clown who dual wields chainsaws, or Cliff who can pop in and out of doors. The bosses were unique, and while they were regular people at one time, they're still dangerous, and arguably more dangerous than the zombies themselves. But they didn't make the zombies any less of a threat, and didn't put the zombies in the back burner, because zombies were the reason for them to act like this. You know how I just brought up Cliff? The reason why he goes insane is a mixture of his time in the military and watching his granddaughter die to zombies. And then everything was war. It's psychological stuff like that that makes the game interesting and how zombies can blend into the world. It makes the lore more fleshed out. The game itself was set up in an interesting manner too with the time system. Every five seconds you spend in the game, a minute passes. It pressed the players into time management, making decisions and had them learn the game in and out finding out where weapons and food caches were, and this would suck if it wasn't for the Groundhog Day mechanic. Basically, whenever you died, you'd be allowed to restart the game. However, you'd carry over your experience. And not just your own personal experience, but the experience of Frank. Meaning, he'd be an objectively better character going into the game. Sure, the time mechanic could still be bullshit at times, but it was still something that pressed the players, and with the Groundhog Day mechanic, it made a very unique blend that really hadn't been seen in many games at that point. Especially zombie games. Frank would grow with the player the more they played the game and unlock more fancy moves. Speaking of, I'm pretty sure we should talk about Frank and then go into inside of the story. Frank West is a freelance journalist going into... Willamette. Colorado. The town's locked down as you're flying over the town in a helicopter. You see what Frank and the pilot call riots. Look, I, I know riots can be messy, but when you see people eating each other, I think there's something more than just rioting. Doesn't sound like civil disobedience. It's too quiet. Anyway, you go to the mall and you've got three days to figure out the mystery where these zombies came from and get out with the story. I will be going into more detail in a few minutes, but for what I will say now is that the game is detailed, I found it enjoyable. And it gave you a lot of different endings, and even offered an overtime mode that gave you an additional campaign if you did specific things throughout the story, which would effectively extend your playtime. Keep that in the back of your head. We'll be, uh... <laughs> we'll be coming back to that later in this video. Speaking of the story, while I gave a brief overview of it, let's give a small detailed rundown of the narrative. Years ago, in the small town of Santa Cabeza, an old fart of a scientist named Dr. Barnaby accidentally created zombies when he was trying to find a way to clone cows. I don't know how you go from cloning cows to creating zombies, but hey hey, science I guess! Zombies. Anyway, the zombie plague pretty much destroyed Santa Cabeza and the United States government covered up the incident, but there were two survivors, Carlito and Isabella, both of whom decided to get revenge on Dr. Barnaby and the United States government. They unleashed the zombie virus in... Willamette. And Frank West comes in, landing in Willamette Mall. You came by helicopter, didn't you? Nah, he came by jet ski. Of course he came by helicopter! Are you stupid?! Yes. Then, after some reject of the Golden Girls somehow managed to overpower two grown men, she opens the door to the mall and the zombies come pouring in. Damn, we gotta get those old people off steroids. Frank then meets Jesse and Brad, two members of the government who are on order to investigate and deal with Carlito. Hold it! And yes, we are looking for the man in that picture. Skipping a bunch of gameplay, we learn the truth when Carlito's dying when he was facing off against a rather... And that's a super abridged version of the story, and I didn't even give the ending because I actually want you guys to play the game. Go ahead. It's a really good game if you can get it. Sure, it's not the greatest story ever told, but it certainly isn't offensive, and it does play around with a tired idea of fighting zombies. Although, fun fact, when the game first came out, it had a sticker on the cover that basically was their way of saying, Don't sue us, George Romero! Especially when you consider that there were themes of consumerism in the game's story, much like how Day of the Dead was. There are interesting themes in the game. Stuff like, you can hit nature hard, but it'll just hit hard as back. And it's not just the tired and tame, consumers are like zombies! You'd have to be a complete idiot to think that it'd be a compelling story to tell with a narrative with zombies would be a good idea. <laughs> 
Anyway, I think it's important to talk about Frank Westmore, since, well, he's part of the reason what made the game great. Yeah, he wasn't the suave character you see in games, especially Japanese games at the time. He didn't have the hair of Cloud Strife, he didn't have superpowers, although he could do backflips. He was just a regular guy. Sure, he had his sarcastic moments, but he was mostly down to earth and respected life. An example is when you face off against Paul, a psychopath in the game. You obviously fight the guy, and it's clear he's messed up in some regard, but you can actually save him after the boss fight. I mean, after taking a picture of his crotch being on fire, because why not? Fantastic. All the guy needed was one good deed to help turn him around. Frank doesn't want to kill people, not only because it's obviously a bad thing, but doing so would have a potential lead go up in flames, starting at the crotch. Frank isn't a good guy, but he's definitely not a monster. And he wasn't spouting off one-liners in the game consistently, and he certainly wouldn't allow people to kill others right in front of him. I feel a disturbance in the force. Right. Frank isn't the most compelling character. He wasn't Mega Man, although you could certainly dress up as him, but he was likable enough and certainly didn't annoy players. There's a reason why he got the spin-off title, but we'll get to that later when we talk about Dead Rising 2. So yeah, there was a lot of appeal to the first game. It wasn't the greatest, but it certainly was a good enough game to warrant a sequel title. And even a few... terrible movies that hardly anyone talks about. And for good reason. I think before I actually get to talking about the game's sequel, it's important that we talk about what came between the two titles. Unlike a lot of games, especially nowadays, there was a prequel story for the second game, Dead Rising 2 Case Zero. It takes place about four years before Dead Rising 2 takes place, and it was available only on the Xbox Arcade for about five bucks, and it only lasted an hour. But it still gave people a chance to experience the gameplay for the second title, and even transfer your experience and money that you earned in the main game. A shame that the only way to access this content now is through the arcade. Like, this should have been included in the future releases of Dead Rising 2, especially considering that it does have elements to the story included that would help the player. When the games were released in 2016 to a future consoles, they were heavily criticized for not including the DLC expansions. In Case Zero, we meet Chuck Green, our new protagonist, who, unlike Frank, was a motocross champion and a father to his daughter Katie, both of whom just escaped from Las Vegas, which just had a zombie outbreak. Yeah, the zombie plague from Willamette got out and is now spreading, and unfortunately, Katie's mother bit her. Luckily, during the time of the first game, there's a medication that suppresses the zombie plague, but needs to be taken every 12 hours. The only reason I'm bringing this up now is because it's necessary to know this in the main game's story, and it changes a little bit. Case Zero gave you a taste of how Chuck played, and immediately you could tell a difference between the first and second titles. Chuck operated a little bit smoother, guns were easier to control, and you can move while you aimed. And there was one big addition that really made the series, one that was more fleshed out in Dead Rising 2's full game. Combo weapons, baby! Patriarchy! Thanks to this handy dandy mechanic, Chuck can create weapons of mass zombie genocide, with them ranging from the practical and rather broken location of the knives taped to boxing gloves, to shooting fiery ping pong balls, to... Hey, a better Jedi than Rey. I bypassed the compressor. The weapons managed to add a bit more flair and color into the world, and it made sense. I mean, most of the time, even with my favorite weapon, the knives with boxing gloves, I'll never understand why one knife can turn to six. But it added a new level of complexity to the base game, as it allowed you to up your arsenal, as well as kill zombies in more hilarious fashions. There was a bit of an issue with the combo weapons though, as they were too good, too plentiful, and the moment you got them, the regular weapons may as well be practically useless. Especially since you get some of the best weapons just outside the safe room in Dead Rising 2. The knife, boxing gloves, and the light slave. <sighs> and the lightsaber. It kind of makes the game a bit too easy, especially when the materials respawn as soon as you enter and exit an area. Don't get me wrong, the game can still be challenging and it's fun to paddle saw through the zombies. It's a fabulous concept that really made the games more memorable. And I kind of spilled out of Case Zero and went to the actual Dead Rising 2, so let's just keep going. The story takes place in Fortune City, a new version of Las Vegas, if you will. Chuck's on the latest and greatest television show, Terror is Reality, hosted by... I love you, TK! Poopy-doo-scoop. 
Chuck's doing this so we can get money for more Zombrex, that medication I brought up earlier for his daughter. At this time though, it has to be taken every 24 hours, but as you can imagine, zombies get loose, Chuck is accused of starting this massacre, and it's up to you to save Katie and clear your name. And I gotta say, I like the idea of the plot. It adds a bit more of a personal note to the story, since if you want to create some grade A investment, add a little kid to the mix. Although, really, it comes up as a cheap Hollywood attention-grabbing move now that I think about it. The best and cheapest way to get an audience to care for a character and make them relatable is to give them a kid! Here at Hollywood Studios, we've been conscious of what successful films have not only been made, but have stood the test of time. After many decades of research, we've realized that part of the process of making a successful film is having a good story. Turns out, all we had to do was place a dainty, slimmer rock next to it with one or two pebbles by its side. Oh, please don't kill him! He's got a family! And then we smashed it. It's... It, it's awful. And that sort of thing has been slowly creeping into the world of gaming. Last of Us, The Evil Within 2, Amnesia... I don't know, it's just something that I've noticed as games have become more and more like films. And it's something I don't want to happen to video games, especially with how trash Hollywood has become. But enough of me ranting about that. Dead Rising 2 was a very good follow-up to the original game, and there were a few things that changed. Chuck was a little more stiff to control, the camera was a little bit closer to Chuck than it was to Frank in the original game, but it really didn't bug me in that regard. Dead Rising 2 is a fun game to be had. With a lot more combo setting and the inclusion of combo weapons, it made the gameplay a lot more memorable. And like the first game, it still had a number of endings, and even had an alternative scenario that would allow you to get an optional final boss and more content to explore the city. It certainly didn't make for a fun idea to see you romp around the city. What also helps is that the game is that there is the introduction of a new kind of zombie. You see, in the original game, the only time you get a different type of zombie is when the game turned to night, and that would only have the zombies act more aggregated and become stronger, slightly. And that was kind of bare bones. However, when it's Dead Rising 2, they introduce a new kind of zombie, gas zombies. These bad boys are bigger, stronger, uglier, and they love to throw up on ya! <laughs> And if you get hit, you'll be flinching enough for them to grapple ya. Seriously, these things will really give you a bad time if you're not equipped well, because sometimes they don't even take the weapons right. Of course, and if you allow me to be opinionated, the best part of this generation of Dead Rising came from a different form. The Fortune City Incident. People always ask me about it. Why didn't you cover it? Why didn't you break the story? The next question people always ask is, well, if you'd been there, what would you have done differently? Everything. I'm going to Uranus Zone! This was something I'm pretty sure hasn't happened in gaming before. A what if story version of the original Dead Rising 2, where instead if you play of Chuck Green, you were playing as the original main character, Frank West. Now, if I had a choice between the original and off the record, I would suggest playing off the record. Not only does the game streamline the process of using Zombrex, meaning you can take it whenever you want and you don't have to stop what you're doing to go back to the safe house as you would have to in Dead Rising 2's original, but there's also a new area to explore, more original combo weapons, as well as some very fun bosses. Not to mention, I find the game to be a lot more enjoyable because of the sarcastic quips that Frank delivers. They're smarmy, they don't come off as annoying, and he acts serious when he needs to. Frank is back, and in a good way. You here to get your next big scoop? No way, pal. I'm not here for work. This is my vacation! But yeah, off the record to me is a superior version of the second game of Dead Rising games. And the reason why I'm not going too far into the story is because I feel like you guys should be the ones experiencing it. I want you to get this game. They are really cheap to find nowadays. There is one more thing I should bring up, and that's Case West, as it was a DLC chapter for Dead Rising 2. It was an epilogue chapter that featured Chuck Green and Frank West teaming up, and it's a really good DLC. Again, I don't want to give too much away about the story for it, but let's just say it sets up the story for the third title in a way. I'll also say that the boss of the DLC is... well... I'm kind of surprised no one complained about that boss. Dead Rising 2 wasn't the greatest follow-up in video games, but it certainly solidified in the hearts of fans that the series was going to survive and evolve. That it was willing to produce fine content, and of course make the games all the more outlandish and fun. After all, who doesn't want to tear through zombies with chainsaws on a pontoon or? It's oddly satisfying. 
Throw in the fact that the characters were a lot more colorful and out there, as well as improving upon the psychopaths from the original game, Dead Rising 2 and Off the Record cemented themselves as great follows for the franchise. Looking towards the psychopaths, you certainly had some interesting ones, such as a mascot who went insane, a crazed protester who was trying to fight you for zombie rights, and your typical console fanboy. I joke, but the bosses did take another page out of reformatting the psychopaths and tried different characters. They didn't just basically slap on the same mechanics, which is something that a lot of games with sequels do. And with off the record, Frank's weathered personality and sarcasm added more charm to the game, making it more enjoyable since Frank came off as if he was a player's surrogate. Like for example... If Adam was your brother... I'd hate to meet your sister. Frankly, this is where I think Dead Rising really managed to make a name for itself, as it managed to appeal to a larger audience, helped by the fact that Dead Rising 2 and Off the Record were actually ported to outside a single console system, it really expanded the franchise's reach. Although, the DLC for Dead Rising 2 still remains exclusive to this very day on the Xbox. Still, the series was on fire and looking great, and before Dead Rising 2 officially released, talk for the third game was in the works, and the third title in the series was on its way, albeit with some... shaky ground, I suppose. So, this is where things started to go a bit downhill. To clarify, Dead Rising 3 is not a bad game. I don't think it is at all. However, it's a heavily flawed Dead Rising game. The game itself is not bad per se if it's on its own, but we're talking about a series here. This time we're in Los Perdidos, playing as the young mechanic called Nick Ramos. You've got six days to explore the city and find a way out and survive. And there's a lot of mix going on here in Los Perdidos. But I think in order to be fair, we should talk about some of the positives before I get with the issues that I've had with this title. First, the controls. Nick was actually a lot more fluid to control than Frank or Chuck, and you could now sprint. Oh yeah, I uh, didn't bring up the fact you couldn't sprint in previous titles. Oops. There's also heavy, light, and ground attacks that you can do. But probably the biggest thing that changed was the combo weapon system. Not only are there new combo weapons that you can make, but Nick can make a combo weapon on the fly. He doesn't need a workbench. You can also combo combo weapons to make super combo weapons. There was one such weapon in Dead Rising 2's DLC where you could combine things to make the laser gun, but... There's a much bigger variety. <laughs> There's also the fun little addition where you can combine vehicles, which is helpful in concept and they expanded the map, since you got a whole city to explore instead of just a mall. But more on that later. So yeah, they've managed to streamline the combo system and expand upon the combo system as well by including new elements in the gameplay. I'll give you an example of something we've made much easier that everyone seems to like, um, is the combo system. So when you find the blueprint, you know, you still have to find the blueprint to make the combos, but um, you don't have to go to a workbench and do it. Um, you can combo on the fly. So once I've got the ingredients for the recipe, if I find the stuff that goes in there, it says, hey, do you want to combo right now? Yeah, I would, because I don't want to have to walk over and find that to do it. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. I feel like I just found something that was crooked and stupid. Anyway, there are a few more fun aspects to said game, like for example how there's much bigger variety of the zombies, both mechanically and design choices. There's a fun little aspect that the zombies all have randomized appearances, and they won't just be shambling around. Depending on who they were before they turned, they'll actively change tactics, like football players will charge at you and tackle you to the ground, or how cop zombies will carry handguns and actually shoot off rounds. 
and said rounds can actually hit Nick. Side note, there's a lot more realistic gore with the zombies. In previous titles, they'd essentially just be filled with red jello. Not here though. Ooh, that's a nice slice. Probably the biggest change is that you can save whenever and wherever you want. You don't need to find a bathroom in order to save your game, which, you know, is good. And it's a little bit less tension though, but hey, I'm down for that. Now these are just a handful of the positive changes, and there were others, but I should probably discuss the negatives of said game. One of the most notable changes is that this is one of the brown and gray games. You see, during this time period where this game came out, there were a really terrible trend that's still going on to this day, where a lot of games opt out of colorful graphics and will go for a more grim, realistic look. And I use realistic with quotation marks on that. This design choice flew into Dead Rising 1 and 2's design philosophies. Both of those games had colorful settings and backgrounds that were a stark contrast to the story, as well as The Walking Undead. There's nothing wrong with this kind of artistic design, but it really took away from some of the charm of the previous two games had. And while there were some obvious themes and design choices that made the game if you looked hard enough, the palette choice certainly was a factor as to why people wrote off the game's level design. The camera was a bit more of an issue as well, mainly with the shaky cam. It got so bad that there were actually reports of people getting legit sick and couldn't play the game for long periods of time. Even though you had combo vehicles, there were a ton of roadblocks that limited how far you could use them. So while they had this fun new concept, they severely kneecapped the ability to use them. Although there were some that you could actually use if you knew what to do, but eh. The next two are what really hurt Dead Rising 3's experience for me. The weapon lockers and the extended time limit. The weapon lockers were an... Interesting addition to the main gameplay. It basically allowed you to store every unlocked weapon and combo that you had. You could have the best combo weapons at your fingertips with no price. And this wasn't a new game plus thing. This was in the base campaign. Once you get the best items, there's no need to use anything else since you can get more of the best weapons at a whim. Sure, there was a bit of a cooldown period, but that's kind of, you know, small potatoes in comparison to this. And the extended time limit was also off-putting. Not only because did they give you too much time to complete everything, it really comes to the factor of how the original two games were so good and made you do time management. I'm not one of those snobs who thinks that challenge just automatically makes the game good. Hollow Knight, Mega Man, Cuphead, Super Meat Boy, Niho, What? Devil May Cry, no not that one. If I look past the fact that he's just like really cool and edgy, with them having different levels of difficulty, they aren't good because they're challenging, they're good because they expect the player to engage with their gameplay and work with their limitations as well as not actually holding the player's hands. The problem with Dead Rising 3 is it gives the players too much freedom without a lot of cost, not to mention the survivors. Now, survivors weren't the greatest in the first game. Their AI was terrible. I brought this up with the pool of water. Dead Rising 2 did make the AI a little better. At least then they wouldn't screw you over when you had them recruited. Dead Rising 3? BEAT HIS ASS, BOYS! Yeah, the survivors can actually be used as a small, tiny, mini army. Even to the point where you can actually beat up some of the psychopaths in the game if you use them right. This is a cool concept, but it does make the game a bit too easier than I think it should be. Well, unless you want to get into the fray, because then they'll just get in the way if you want to use them as fighters. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad the survivors are able to do things like giving them their own unique ability to not die and even weaponize them. And heck, they can be useful when you're searching buildings as they keep the zombies out. And to be fair, the game did also add a difficulty mode. It's the first for the series, with Nightmare Mode, which ramps up the difficulty a quite a bit. But when it comes to Dead Rising 3, the worst aspect it removes anything of survival horror to it. And this ties back into the challenge of things. While I wouldn't consider Dead Rising to be a part of the horror genre specifically, it still had elements of survival horror where you had to be able to manage your inventory, know where you had to go to get specific weapons, and know where you can get some decent healing items. Dead Rising 3, however, doesn't have that. Thanks to the weapon lockers, you can basically have any weapon at your fingertips that you already discovered, so if you manage to get the better weapons in the game, congrats. You can get it from any of the safe houses via the magical lockers that were in the Resident Evil games. This actively hurts exploration since in previous games you'd have to be able to know where the items were. You could go to the best routes, get them, and you know where things like the work tables, the save stations, and the fast travel routes if you wanted to go save survivors. Now here's the thing. I am a bit conflicted on the gameplay in some regard. I will say I do like the skill tree system here on paper. Or 
the attributes as they're called. In concept, I like the idea. It allows you to improve Nick in any way you'd like at any point you can. I'm a guy who loves the games that give you the option how to customize or choose what attributes you need at the time for your character as it gives you a chance to have a skill that can get you out of a pickle should you have any trouble going through certain aspects of a game. Now, those in the audience who love to leave essays in the comments section may have noticed the words I used in that last point. Words like in, concept, and the. The problem is that the game overdoes it, such as making the sprinting being made infinite or the ability to equip every book to give you a constant boost. Or my personal bane, especially considering my last rant about this, it's the portable locker. You see, it's a portable vehicle that, while it's an interesting concept, basically takes away the one thing that stopped you from abusing the lockers that I mentioned about. Normally, you'd have to go to a safe room, but you got this portable monster. Yeah, it can't really fight back, but it still has that issue that I brought up. There's another issue, and that's with the final perk system. Now, to point something out, in the previous games, when you had reached the higher levels and you still had all the skills, the boost in inventory and health, sure, the game was easier, but you still didn't have much of an advantage over the mobs of zombies or the psychopaths. If you were too reckless, you could still be killed, and the hordes could get you if you're still ill-prepared. I know what I'm saying is extremely anecdotal, but I never actually died in my first run of Dead Rising 3. Granted, I was on the standard mode, but I never really wanted to come back to play Nightmare mode. At least not in death and not for this video. And I don't have proper console in which to play originally, so... There are other things I want to talk about when it concerns with this title, namely the psychopaths and the story as well as the DLC. Let's start with the psychopaths. A good chunk of them were based off the seven deadly sins, which, you know, is a tired trend to base bosses off of, as it more often than not forces you to put your characters into certain kinds of personality types. That isn't to say it's the same all the time with this, but it's definitely the case here. For Gluttony, you got Darlene the Fatty, Lust, Dylan the Gimp, and for pride, it is man! And just to make it clear, the game came out in 2013, and that whole incident came out in 2018. Now, aside from the tired theme of sins going on, there are other problems with the psychopaths, and that's mainly because they're not really all that believable to me. I know that considering that this is the game where you can basically create lightsabers and dragon suits that breathe fire, that I shouldn't be complaining about realism. But that's the thing with Dead Rising. While there were comedy aspects as well as there being out-of-the-world instances, the world is grounded in realism. The comedy stems from the gameplay, it comes from the weird items you can use to smack the zombies around, and it comes from that you're actually wearing during the cutscenes. However, despite all that goofiness, the characters still treated the situations they were in seriously. The characters still reacted to the world and the tragedies that were happening. And this extended to the psychopaths. In the first game, there were a lot of people who basically turned into psychopaths. For example, Cletus the Gun Salesman wasn't exactly a psychopath, but a man who was afraid of the zombies and became afraid of people who would be after his gun supply. Or in Off the Record, and spoilers, Chuck Green, yes he is a boss in Dead Rising 2 Off the Record, he loses his daughter Katie and he breaks down to the point where he thinks a doll that he has strapped to his back is her, and he has to do what he can to protect her. I don't get that vibe with the psychopaths in Dead Rising 3, with only one exception, and I would only call him a psychopath. Then again, considering what's going to be happening... <laughs> but we're saving that for a few more minutes. Back to my original point, another reason why they didn't just click with me as the previous ones did is, well, they just came off generic to me. Maybe that's just me, but it seemed like the fact that a lot of them were over-exaggerated characters, and some of them even the cusp of stereotypes. Auntie. Granted, it's not the be-all, end-all for me. Similar to the psychopaths of the previous Dead Rising games, the maniacs are tough survivors who went nuts during the outbreak. I'm at least thankful that we have psychopaths in this game. Getting away from that depressing thought, let's talk about Nick and the story at the same time. Nick is actually the youngest of the protagonists in the games thus far being a young mechanic in Los Perdidos. Nick isn't really all that compelling of a character to me. Now, I'm not saying Frank West or Chuck Green were the deepest characters in all of gaming. If they were puddles, I would certainly wouldn't get my feet wet as their motivations and personalities weren't exactly what I'd call memorable. Editor's note. I do not agree with this statement. Not one bit. He's covered wars, you know. But they were both at least confident, and had motivations to brave the zombie outbreak that were relatable and interesting. Nick, on the other hand, isn't exactly of the same ilk, especially when you learn that Nick happens to be immune to the zombie disease. 
something he learns after he gets bitten. I mean... Maybe I'm immune, I don't know. I'm being snarky here, obviously. As it turns out, due to the events of the first game, Nick has a bit of a connection to Carlito. Again, if you want to know the actual story for the first game, go play it for more details. Getting back to DR3, aside from his immunity, there's not a lot of development for Nick. Now, I've gone on record saying that you don't need to have a character to develop during a story, since the main idea of Dead Rising, something that we've seen with Frank and Chuck, is that they don't actually develop as characters. They're older characters who are set in their ways and have their own moral compasses that were developed and reflect their actions in the game. Nick isn't really the same though. He's a younger fellow who starts off the game being nervous and afraid of what's happening. And that happens throughout the majority of the game. And then he becomes angry. I'm gonna kill you with my bare fucking hands, you son of a bitch! We've got a badass over here. Like, in a majority of the cutscenes in the game, Nick carries on with his usual scared and inexperienced behavior. And it isn't until the later part of the game that he actually becomes... Badass? I will admit that as the story goes along, Nick in-game does act a little more confident when you actually play the game. And while it is a nice touch, it's a bit at odds with the cutscenes, especially with the psychopaths. There's also the main story of the game, and it comes off as very... What are the right words to use here? Dry bones, I guess? Like, there was nothing that really hooked me into the story to really care about Nick and the other characters, and in some cases, some motivations came out of nowhere. There's also a bit of a romantic subplot, and that's really all I could say about it. I don't know what to tell you, as the romantic subplot is something you can find in any flick that shoehorns in a dime a dozen romance. I'm not saying I don't appreciate that sort of thing, but I'd rather I just don't think that it's really all that necessary in Dead Rising. I mean, the most we'd gotten Dead Rising before when it came to romance was... They didn't teach me that in journalism school. So, don't get me wrong, that's schlocky too, but at the very least it didn't take up the main portion of the story and was mostly just a side point and didn't have any actual foothold in it. Let's also take a look at the ending. And spoilers. Then again, I already warned that there would be spoilers in this video, so... Whatever. Consider the endings for the first two Dead Rising games that are canonical. There's a trend where the main protagonist will be put into a rather dire situation. It wasn't a happy ending, and it left you wondering what would happen to these characters what you were playing as. Meanwhile... Nick? Nick, are you okay? I'm doing just fine, Annie. We're on our way, okay? Me and Dad. Then we have to pick up Isabella. She she went back to the lab to find something. I was worried, Nick. I, I can't lose you now. Don't worry. You won't. Everything turns out great for the protagonist. Now, I'm not opposed to happy endings. Hell, the overtime endings for Dead Rising 2 and Off the Record are decidedly coded to be happy endings. There's just something final about this ending, especially when you consider the events of the game and Nick's immunity to zombieism. But unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case, so it kind of rubs me the wrong way. Finally, let's talk about the DLC, because it's kind of a mixed bag. The untold stories of Los Perdidos, and for the low, low price of $29.99, you can play as four other characters in the city and learn their stories. Unfortunately, the DLC didn't really deliver for me. Most of the missions consisted of fetch quests or rescue missions surrounded with a cutscene. What didn't help was that the characters we were playing as weren't exactly the deepest of characters. Yes, they were side characters in Nick's story, in one case who also was a psychopath, but we learned about them couldn't have been discerned from what we had in Nick's story. And the fact that the stories were pretty much carbon copies of each other didn't help. They fell flat and they felt they were made cheaply. And that's because that wasn't the original plan. Randolph Steyer is one of the designers of the game and came out a while ago with an article expressing some of the design choices that were made for the game. If you get a chance, give it a read. It's interesting to read this stuff if you have any interest in game design work. 
The original plan for the DLC came in two packages, a prologue similar to Dead Rising 2 Case Zero, and a three-part epilogue that would see each mainline series characters star in their own episode. I personally preferred these and the stories that we wrote for them, but due to the exclusivity rights and the move to the Xbox One, the time and budget we required to make the original designs were gone. That leads us to where we landed, the untold stories of Los Perdidos. So we would have gotten a similar DLC treatment that Dead Rising 2 had, but expanded upon as well. I wonder if there were other plans for like an off the record version of Dead Rising 3 that actually would have been pretty fun to actually play. But as the quote stated, it was the exclusivity rights and the transfer of the Xbox One that caused this change. Another reason why I hate limited titles. Before Dead Rising 3 was completely locked down, I was put in charge of DLC planning for two of four episodes. The budget was thin, the timeline was tight, and resources were still hammering on the main game. Regardless of that, this was one of the most fun parts of the project. The world had already been constructed, and all we had to do was create mission content. You know, I can appreciate a developer's woes, but this just seems like unfair treatment. It seemed like the developers really wanted to do what happened last time, but were trying to make the best out of the current situation for the DLC. That, and no offense mind you, I don't think was really worth it. Sometimes when criticizing something like a piece of media, you tend to forget that there are people behind the work. People who have a real passion for what they're doing. Regardless with the prices and stories, I wouldn't recommend getting the DLC. There was one more DLC, and I'm sad to say that this is really a shame, because what we got was... Super Ultra Dead Rising 3 Arcade Remix Hyper Edition EX Plus Alpha! Oh, that is a beautiful sight. I'm not even going to attempt to say all that, but in actuality, this was a pretty fun multiplayer arcade addition to the game. This level of detail put into the costumes that are all callbacks to previous Capcom titles, complete with voiced clips. It was a fun arcade styled game that really made this sort of dreary looking game amazing. It was fun, it was interesting, and it certainly was worth the price of admission. But, and there always has to be a but, this DLC is exclusive to the Xbox. And last time I checked, you cannot get this on the PC version of DLC. Don't get me wrong, while I find the third edition to be disappointing as a Dead Rising title, it's not a bad game. Sure, I'm a bit more harsh with it than with the previous titles, but that's because it was a start to what would lead into something much, much, MUCH WORSE! Still, I acknowledge that perhaps I'm being a bit unfair to the game. It still has a lot of positives to it, but considering that to this day it remains only on PC and Xbox, it really hurt the game's potential reach in the long run. Hell. When the game first came out, I had dipped out of buying the latest consoles for a while. The only reason why I got back into stuff like console titles was because of, well... I think you get the reason why. Still, while it may have made things a little too easy for my taste, Dead Rising 3 still offered something new and fun for players. And frankly, I do think the game does get a bad rep nowadays. Especially considering how some people will put the game on the same level as... What the fuck? Hippity hoppity, get the fuck off my property! You know, when my father was still around, he would always tell me that he hated the holidays. It was a completely foreign concept to me at the time. How could anyone hate Christmas? It was a time of joy, a time of family, a time of giving. My old man told me the reason why he came to hate the holidays wasn't due to things like corporatism of it. It wasn't because of bad Christmases with his family. No, 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 no. He hated it because he was a radio DJ and had to listen to the same tired Christmas music for God knows how long during his shifts. And up until a few years ago, I couldn't understand his pain. At least until this game! Yes, though I also answer to hey asshole or Frank who? Manufacturing or meat packing or fucking fruit, I don't know. 
wouldn't go. Oh, oh, oh. Who wouldn't go up on the housetop? Click, click, click. Down through the chimney with those You know, a lot of the time, whenever I sound angry in my videos, it's mostly played up for laughs. Or I'm playing a character. What? You think I'm actually a black and white caricature of a manga boy with pointy yes. ears? But I want it to be known far and wide, Dead Rising 4 is a mess of a video game. It is probably one of the worst ways a sequel could go down ever. I hate this game. And this will probably be the longest part of the video. It's going to get loud, so let's get into it. Dead Rising 4 came out in December of 2016, and all honesty, it was already having some terrible signs to it. You know those developers I showed slightly earlier? These were the people whom were given the reins. People who had no actual connection to the previous titles. Now, this isn't a death sentence. There are a lot of developers who take the reins from games that have no connection with previous titles. Hell, you can even make that argument with Dead Rising itself, since Dead Rising 2 was made by a Canadian studio rather than a Japanese one. The problems start to crop up not from when you start the game, no 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 no, much earlier. The problems crop up with the moments we received any interviews from the development team. And if you don't believe me when I say they were misleading, then see for yourself. The whole Dead Rising franchise has been known for mayhem and just killing tons and tons and tons of zombies. And we've kind of upped the ante for Dead Rising 4. Frank is back. That's so why we have our hashtag, Frank's back. Okay, Frank's back. Frank is back. Frank is cooler, he's tougher, a little wiser, but he's still Frank. Frank's mellowed with age now. He's 16 right. years older, he's 54, he's still Frank. Um, but, you know, his, his sense of humor is better. You messed with my camera again, right? You're a quick one. Uh, that's what she said. But we don't want to force funny down people's throats. We want the gamer to decide what's funny and what's not. Um, and, uh, you know, we think we've really captured what we really wanted Frank to be all along. What are you doing? Uh, for us, I think we were really looking at our roots and going back to one. Hmm. But we, we That's do. the correct answer, by the way. Oh, yes. great. <laughs> uh, so how important is going to be the, uh, like, like, one big thing about Dead Rising is you see a lot of, like, people you have to go save and yep. join your party. Are we going to see more of that in this one? Yep, and it's better. I mean, it's not like, I'm, I'm making the perfect game, right? Going back to the roots. Making the perfect game. And you believe that? How fucking naive are you? You lying goddamn mother! No more saying cuss words, guys! Keep your cool, Common. Keep your cool. You barely started talking about this mess. Alright, look. One of the biggest issues I have with Dead Rising 4 is the marketing push. If there's one thing I really dislike about modern day media, it's the deceptive marketing tactics that plague studios, where they overhype a game like it was the second coming of a retro Christ. And that goes for a lot of marketing that uses these tactics. So things like Marvel or the Spider-Man game doing this, I don't approve of. The only difference is that the end products tend to not actually be made terribly. So they tend to avoid this kind of vitriolic reaction from the player base. Dead Rising 4, however, is not one of those games. There is so much wrong with this game, and it's probably the best example of how a franchise in gaming can have so much rot put onto it when it's in the wrong hands. Take Pokemon for example. People complained about how Pokemon cut a huge part of the decks and lied about the animations. Alright, fair enough. But with Dead Rising 4, they removed some of the most key features to any Dead Rising game. At least with Pokemon, you didn't have multiple basic features removed from Sword and Shield. In Dead Rising 4, you can't even pick up random items or use them as weapons like you could in 1, let alone THROWING PIES AT ZOMBIES! Well, unless you count the cutscene bargain bin sale at the flea market end of the Frank West throwing a chair at a window. I really thought that would work. How does a game from the mid-2000s manage to do something better than a game that was from a previous console generation? Son of a bitch! Alright, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with what this game is about. We're taking control of Hank East, the preferred name, as we go back to the town of Willamette. 
as a new zombie outbreak happens there. The story, if you can even call it that, starts off with Hank being a professor of photojournalism at a college, where he's duped into going to a classified government testing facility by one of his students, Vic. And yes, this isn't really Frank West, no matter how badly you want to argue that it is. This character is the farthest thing away from Frank West. He is practically a new character. And no, that's not just because of the voice change. Frank's entire personality seems to have shifted. God, you killed him? What? No, nah, no, nah, he's just sleeping. Frank, it's a zombie! No shit! Are you okay? My therapist says it's an ongoing process. Right. We need cover. That hotel looks good. Eh, three stars are best. Frank, these guys need medical attention. Can you keep Obscuras off us? Sure. You play Florence Nightingale, I'll be Rambo. When this is over, we can switch. How about I just owe you one instead? Shit, this door is code locked. You can hack the code with your Spectrum Analyzer. Let me guess. You messed with my camera again, right? You're a quick one. That's what she said. Who wants barbecue? No? No one? Holy shit, Frank. This is some atrocity level shit going on here, and the best you can do is crack wise? That is unfair. I have photographed things and thought about things. Your mother was a gopher and your father smells of body spray. Honestly, with how Frank is portrayed in the game, the opening portion of this is actually oddly fitting, just not in the right way. I'll get into why the story itself is terrible, as well as why Frank is here, as both are a major issue as to why so many people who are longtime fans of Dead Rising hate this game. And yes, I say hate. You only need to look on YouTube to see that people have made extremely popular videos expressing their disdain for this title. Well, I guess you can throw me onto that list now. So, let's start with the gameplay. That's the most important part of a game like this. So, how does it play and look? Well... <laughs> Okay, look, I know there are patches and updates to fix this mess, but there are so many issues like going on since day one. This is one of the signs that developers rushed this product out before fixing these issues, and I don't find that to be acceptable. One of the biggest changes in the gameplay would have to be the control and inventory system. I combine those two because this is the one of the many shortcomings of the game. Originally, you'd have melee, throwable, range, and consumables marked to the D-pad on your controller. The problem with this is that it limits the gameplay, especially considering the fact you can no longer throw pies! In terms of the food, we've streamlined that too, because we've done it where you can go, you pick up the food, and instantly put it into a separate inventory, oh, and then you have all your little uh, crosses on the bottom, yeah, yeah. and then when you need to hit food down on the D-pad, bam, fill it up, you don't, you still see the animation of doing it, but you don't have to go and spend time to prepare the food, oh, man. because pe we found people really didn't like that. I would love to know who the f*** these people are that these developers talk to. So, let's explain this. Not only did you take away the ability for me to throw any non-throwable weapons away, including swords, pies, drinks, none of that is throwable now, but you also changed the entire inventory system? I never understood why they thought this wasn't fast. In previous Dead Rising games, you just cycle through your inventory and it only took a matter of seconds to do so. They were also mapped to the triggers on the controller, meaning you can shift through the items quickly. And since it was mentioned, I might as well talk about it, mixed drinks were taken out. I mentioned this briefly, but that's mainly because I want to talk about it here. In the past Dead Rising games, you could mix foods in a blender and they'd give you some interesting effects upon consumption. One of the best was Quick Step, which does exactly what you think. You gain the ability to go fast! Or Spitfire, which allowed you to temporarily have the ability to chuck super spits at your enemies, and it would actually hurt them. You are basically spitting literal saliva bullets like you are the hobo from hobo games. Point is, there are a lot of pros getting the drinks. In addition, they would heal you upon consumption, so things like ketchup, which weren't all that useful save for making zombies slip on it, could be used to help recover HP by mixing it with something else. Getting back to the inventory when it came to throwable items, Frank now just throws them in an arc. Frank can no longer whip plates at zombies or kick the soccer ball, now he just throws whatever he can. Seriously, who were these fans who asked for this? Give me back my ability to throw pies at zombies, you bearded monsters! Christmas. Zombies. And everything gore. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect little game. 
but Capcom accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction. Campcom Vancouver. I'm making the perfect game, right? Uh, <laughs> You're a bunch of fucking comedians, aren't you? You remember when I gushed about how you could call on your inner wrestler and do so much damage to the zombies? Well, things like that are no longer usable upon command. What you need to do now is build up combos and then you perform said action. And a lot of these skills that you required in previous games no longer exist. The developers managed to take a branch out from Dead Rising 3, using a skill tree system which allows you to boost your stats, but you don't get the fun skills like ripping zombie guts out. One small thing to note that really irks me is unarmed combat. You could easily punch the zombies in the last games, all you need to do was go to a slot that didn't have an item. Not the case here, if you try to attack them while you still have a weapon equipped, the game will automatically equip the item to attack with. Well, thanks, Obama. In this game, in 4, are we going to see, you know, the same traditional, like, day and night cycles and, like, a, a, a hard day limit for when you have to be finished with the game? No. So oh. we've taken the time away. Oh, wow. Because we had a lot of... So what we did, we kept time in one place and we got rid of it in another. Um, because this game has got so much more side content and stuff to explore and find, um, we, we, we did a lot of testing and we found that people could never complete the stuff in the amount of time, and then we had to give you so much time to do it, that time meant nothing. Who exactly were these testers? In so much content, dude, considering that none of the survivors have backstories that they're sterilized into. You'd, you'd help a survivor and they go, thanks. Remember in Dead Rising 2, the girl who woke up in her underwear and you'd have to take off your clothes so she wouldn't feel embarrassed just to save her? Or playing poker against cheating bots that may as well be unfair as YouTube's own bots? Or Dead Rising 3, the old lady who wishes to revisit all the places she loved and reminisce about her husband? Or the guy who wants you to bring him zombies so he can make a porno? There's absolutely nothing like that in the base game. I just can't get over how lazy this level of design is, especially when it's in comparison to the previous titles. And you have the gall to say what you did here was better? That all this side content was the reason that the time system was removed? Yeah, you know the time system I brought up? The one that was in all three of the previous games? That's gone! One of the, you know, wonderful, unique things about the first game uh, was the time constraints and whatnot, mm. and obviously Zombrikes in the second game. Right. A lot of that was sort of, like, left by the wayside. I yes. mean, there was elements of it in 3. <clears throat> uh, are you going to reintroduce some of that into to Dead Rising 4? Uh, we're not doing time elements in this mm. right now, and uh, there is no cure currently in this game. Right. Uh, we wanted to really allow players to explore our world more than they've been able to in the past. With the time element in there, you weren't able to go into every store and look everywhere. Mm. Right, which is why you decided to block off a ton of stores in the mall. Also, I guess stuff like the Saint Achievement, which allowed you if you saved all the survivors, or psychopath runs. I'm sorry, I just do not believe this at all! My own experience with the titles of Dead Rising 1 and 2 allowed me to explore along the way, and even then, there were things like the sandbox modes, which allowed players to explore the maps without having to worry about the story or keeping up with cases of Zombrex. We do a lot of user research. Mm. We send a ton of research out, and we do a lot of Q&A with people, and we found out that the people, it was okay, some people really liked it, but more people didn't like it because they wanted to be able to go, you know what? You ended my game and I was so close and I don't want to have to go do that all again. Right. You know, they didn't want to have that pressure. Um, and so what we wanted to do is we really wanted to make sure the, the world was really open. Lots of side missions, lots of stuff to discover. Um, and let people... Uh, it's still the same Dead Rising, but we, we've taken some stuff away and added a ton more. Hmm. What? What the hell are you talking about? Who the hell are these people you talk to? Dead Rising didn't end the game for you if you failed a mission. You were allowed to continue playing if you didn't make it in time for a mission. Sure, you'd get the bad ending, but you could also continue playing onward or go back to a previous save or checkpoint. I am legit wondering if these developers even played the older titles at this point. We also really want to encourage killing zombies. Right. Yeah, and if you're under a time constraint, and you Probably. see that big group of zombies, and you're like, oh, I want to do it, but sometimes you can't. We want to let the players just go to town on as many zombies oh as possible. God. You could literally do that in the previous games. The games gave you tools to clear massive hordes of zombies. Look, if I want to play a Musou-style game, I'll play Persona 5 Strikers which is a lot more fluid than this massive lumpy flesh and a lot more powerful. That's for sure! It always ends up being a thing for me where I'm like, I'm running low on time and I'm like, I've got two survivors, like, I gotta pick one of the two. And it's like, well, 
not getting a perfect run this time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then people say, oh, oh, I could just go play it again. Yeah, yeah. People don't want to play it again to get that one other thing. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> That's cool. That's uh, I like. To, I, I appreciate that you guys are you're listening to feedback from the gamers. Yeah, you know what the game. You know we get a lot of feedback. Of course, we can't respond to everything, um, but we really try to at least acknowledge that we get a lot of it in, um, and it's important because the people who play our games, they're who we're making the game for. Mm -hmm. So we have to please the most people that we can. Who the hell are these gamers? This was your first Dead Rising game and your last. My God. I gotta get away from these interviews! They're seriously pissing me off listening to this cockamamie bullshit! So, let's talk about the crafting system. Stuff like making combo weapons and combo vehicles. And as such, for a sequel, you'd obviously have to up the ante. So what's left? Upgrading Frank himself. Not in that way! Basically, in the game, you've got these things called exosuits. They allow Frank to power up and mash through mobs, and of course you combine them with certain items to get upgrades. It's a neat concept, but that being said, the exosuits are extremely limited. It's clear that they were put in to deal with mass hordes of zombies. However, they run on limited charges, and as such, they aren't really a good thing to have since they don't last as long as you'd like. They're more like vehicles in this sense. Against solo enemies like the bosses, it's like being challenged to a showdown with a guy wielding a knife and you decide to bring a flamethrower. What doesn't help is that you can't use regular weapons with the exosuit, which kind of sucks because it's a bummer when the whole idea of you being souped up is that you can obliterate zombies more easily, but for some reason you can't use regular weapons and take advantage of the possible combination something that can be used with the exosuits. You can't say, hit zombies with a baseball bat and send them flying like a home run. That's not possible in the game. You can combine the exosuit with some items in order to make combo suits, but they still lack the inability to be interesting to use. In fact, all the combo weapons seem to be rather off-putting. One of the biggest changes to the combo system is that instead of finding specific items for both components, you just need one specific item and combine it with an aspect of another. And some of them are just kind of lazy, like a sword of fire, a sword of ice. I'd also like to point out that Dead Rising 4 has 47 combo weapons. You wanna know how many combo weapons there are in Dead Rising 3? 64. Hell, Dead Rising 2? 50! How do you have less combo weapons than in the game that introduced the concept? That doesn't seem scientifically possible! So I think we've established three things so far in this segment. One, my voice can be very annoying at times. Two, the developers are full of it. I'm making the perfect game, right? And three, Dead Rising 4 has some major issues when it comes to gameplay. And I'm pretty sure I haven't covered them all. Like, apparently this is the game that introduces stealth. A concept while introduced doesn't really mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, and really, from my experience, it's a lot easier just to run through with guns and smash my way through enemies. It's basically taking the gameplay that we had in the previous games and dulling it down in order to appeal to a much wider audience. There are probably a lot of things that you can probably add onto that list, but if I did, this video would probably be hours long, and frankly, considering that there are whole YouTube careers that were made to criticize this game, I'd rather not go that far. But I want to point out that the biggest issue I have with the game is the fact they took so much out while the developers kept saying that they were going back to the roots of the franchise. These guys never had a hand with the original game, which was made by a completely different team altogether. And if they did, then this would be more troubling as the mechanics that were established back in the original game were removed. And for what? That mixing drinks would be removed? That we can't use anything we get our hands on as weapons? All for the sake of mowing down zombies? I can tell you guys, if you like killing zombies, then please, for the love of all that's holy, just stick with the original three titles and off the record. Not only would you be getting more out of a varied experience, but you'd be able to enjoy all the zombie killing goodness at a better price. And frankly, I want to get to talking about the other issues with this game. Like, let's talk about the maniacs. Hmm? What's that? What are maniacs? Why, they're the gimped versions of psychopaths. They're like a total downgrade from the psychopaths from previous titles. One of the major differences is that when you approach the areas where the maniacs are, there's no actual cutscene to introduce them. 
It's an in-game dialogue, and this is a big deal as the cutscenes in the previous games would have show you the personality of the psychopaths as well as give you a much better impact on what the characters were like, learn what they were before when they lost their minds, and for some even learn their motivations, and give you a slight idea on how they would fight you. That and shows a level of polish for your game. They were mostly people who were once regular folk. Maniacs, however... Guess you kissed your mother under the mistletoe, Frank! Am I supposed to be intimidated by you, maniacs? Because I am a little. He has the biggest balls I've ever seen of any game character. Yeah, what didn't help was that the maniacs were essentially clones of Frank, even down to the fact that they attack the same way with their combo weapons. And the only real difference is that they have a lunge attack and have thicker health bar. Not that you would be able to tell sometimes. If you know what you're doing, you can kill these mini-bosses really quick. Hell, a video I would recommend if you're looking for a more in-depth review of this mess of a game is from Tesnakerer. He proved that you can kill the maniacs with not only a random soldiers in this game, but also with the zombies. That's because the maniacs are instantly put on the map. But when it came to previous games, the prior psychopaths had their own areas that would have zombies moved away. Not to mention the psychopaths would have their own mechanics. Like Antoine from Dead Rising 2, a chef who despite his girth was actually a speedy little guy. In addition, he had long and short range attacks, and he would have piles of food that he would go to and snack on in order to heal himself. It's not the deepest boss battle, but he still stood out as one of the more few bosses in the game that could heal themselves. To be fair to the Maniacs though, there was an update made when the game was released on PS4, with said update going to other versions of the game, and that added more difficulty, thus made the Maniacs slightly more durable than toilet paper. But even the number of Maniacs that aren't in the main story are lacking. Most of them don't even have a proper name to them, and they are just masked goons, and there's only five of them. That's right, outside the main story bosses, you've got five maniacs. The developers of the game made it readily apparent that one of the reasons that the time mechanic was removed from the fourth game was so people could enjoy the content. But unfortunately, I'm not seeing said content. Getting back to the psychopaths, even though they were boss fights and could be challenging, they were still rather simple in their designs, since you wouldn't want players wasting all their time defeating them when they could want to do other missions. It would add tension to the fights without making them super complicated, and the games would at least put some items nearby that would help you fight against the psychopaths. However, without those time constraints, one would think that the bosses are in the overworld would get a bit more complicated and would have even some uniqueness to them. After all, you've got all that freedom in a huge map. What's stopping you from making a ton of complex bosses? Think sort of like the bosses in Breath of the Wild that you can encounter. I mean, not literally of course, but in the same vein of having unique mini-bosses that have their own set of mechanics and abilities. But that doesn't exist in Dead Rising 4, and the game hardly has any other content other than the story, the maniacs, and the collectibles. Sure, there are random events in the game, but those are mostly just about survivors and woo boy! I already brought up in earlier that survivors in this game barely have any actual backstories and hinted that they don't have anything interesting about them. Hell, the only two reasons why you'd ever want survivors is to get a combo weapon that they can drop, and how they'll give you EXP for the safe houses that you go to. In previous games, survivors would make it worth your while to risk your neck, such as giving you loads of prestige points, special items such as Zombrex, or even combo cards or money that would help you out in the game. But according to Dead Rising 4's dev team, survivors were the equivalent of that friend who would ask you for money, say thanks, and never see you again. That's not even true in Dead Rising 3, where you had stranded survivors. I'm sorry that I keep bringing up these interviews, but it just baffles me how some of these statements were made. Did these people or Capcom think that we wouldn't know was in the previous games? I can't even say that exploring the mall and town on themselves were that interesting. For example, the mall is a big issue. With a lack of a mall in Dead Rising 3, the prospect of the mall returning as a setting was a good thing. After all, part of the appeal of Dead Rising in Dead Rising 2 is a bit of a wish fulfillment. That if you ever trapped in a zombie apocalypse, that you'd become this badass who could take whatever you could, get your hands on, and smash some brains in, inside one of the most iconic places in zombie fiction. And like I've shown, that part's been surgically removed from the game, meaning that a ton of the reason for that is gone. Most of the shops in the mall are closed. Gone are the shops that would have oodles of items for you to grab and smack a zombie across the head. What I'm getting at is there is a limitation of freedom and creativity, which runs counter to the idea of open world games. The less you give your players to do, the quicker they'll run through the content that you do have. Getting back to Dead Rising 4, that's exactly what they did. 
For the sake of streamlining the process, they removed what made Dead Rising be Dead Rising via the gameplay. Sure, you could still dress up as goofy characters. Sure, you don't need to worry about accidentally eating your food by mistake, but those things are but pale imitations when compared to the previous titles in the franchise. Hell, get yourself an assault rifle and you'll find that taking out bosses and mini bosses is rather pitiful. Especially the soldiers that are wearing the exosuits. Especially those that have flamethrowers since there's a big weakness that would allow you to kill them in one shot. Remember when I brought up challenging games? That's part of the reason why I dislike this title from a gameplay perspective. Instead of forcing the character to think on their feet, manage their time, and learn the map for the sake of getting things done, the developers decided to replace that with... NOTHING! Even mowing down zombies does nothing for me in this title, since if I want to do that, I boot up a copy of Off the Record and farm the sandbox mode. At least there, there are challenges that force me to do unique things, and I'm able to get cash that can be used in the main game. Then it allows me to unlock the big items like the vehicles that you can use to run over zombies. Oh, side note, let's talk about the Christmas theme for this game. Now, remember when I talked about how I learned my father's pain with Christmas music? Well, here's where I talk about the excruciating agony I experienced with it here. I can understand the game with its Christmas theme going on, but it makes it really unsavory to want to play the game outside the holiday seasons. The other three games didn't have that issue. Dead Rising, Americana. Dead Rising 2, Las Vegas. Dead Rising 3, urban with smaller themes for each district. Notice something here? The games up to this point didn't focus on holidays. Rather, they focused on locations and built the world around those locations, adding a lot of cohesion in the design work as well as what kind of weapons you could pick up and use there. It adds a grounded feature to your game. It doesn't run the risk of driving your player base to use a sharpened candy cane as a shiv and commit seppuku to cheap Christmas tunes every time they check the menu. Could have just been a winter theme, and that would have worked. I think I've made my point about the gameplay, and I've spent about 12 pages complaining about it. And we haven't even gotten to the worst part of this game. So, let me make this perfectly clear. When it comes to Frank and the story, it's a complete disaster. And yes, I'm not going to call him Hank anymore. Short story, Frank has become completely annoying and the story is shallow as all hell. Long story, well, now's your chance to get a drink. You got it? Good. So, at the end of the game, Frank West dies. Hold up, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, were you not expecting me to drop that bomb on you? Well, I'm just giving you the Dead Rising 4 experience. Since before the game even came out, this marvelous DLC called Frank Rising was already shown to happen with giving details that Frank would die at the end of the game and reanimate as a zombie. So, thanks for spoiling the ending, devs. What a wonderful big brain you have to match those beards. Can't complain too much, though, since this isn't the first time that Capcom has earned the moniker Crapcom. They did the same thing with Ashura's Wrath, locking the true ending in paid DLC. But this is just worse since it just gave away such a big plot twist and already soured the experience from the get-go, at least for me. Now, Let's talk about Flanderization. If you're not familiar with the term, it's a form of simplifying a character to their essential traits, meanwhile missing the point of their character entirely, and it's arguably that they didn't even know what Frank's essentials were. I love mini golf. And that's basically what Frank West has become in this game. The developers, well... We're going back to our roots. We wanted to make sure that we're honoring uh, Dead Rising and, and where it comes from. Why you always lying? <laughs> oh my god. It's like the developers didn't know the first thing about Frank West, and it just decided to take a completely different character and have him steal the moniker of Frank. <sighs> Look, was Frank West sarcastic? At times, yes. But in the times we've seen him, he also had a serious side and was at the very least a logical person. He didn't want to fight the psychopaths, but he wasn't given him a choice most of the time and the psychopaths would often land the killing blow upon themselves. Frank West wouldn't immediately go after someone or kill them, because that would have been a potential source of information that would help him on the story that he was going through. Not to mention, he wasn't a heartless monster, with Carlito, who was about to die thanks to... Carlito being the man who started the zombie outbreak that killed thousands in Willamette, and because of his actions would cause millions of deaths in the coming future. Frank didn't forgive the guy, but he could tell that there was injustice being done to the man that forced him to become like this, and it was caused by the government in Frank's country. I can't extend that same character beat to Dead Rising Force Frank though. 
Especially if we look at the beginning of the game, it's hinted that Frank West has PTSD involving zombies? But that has nothing to do with the rest of the game. In fact, Frank likes killing zombies. It's a fun pastime for him now. If I had to be frank about Frank, there are two major issues I have with his depiction in Dead Rising 4. The first being the fact that I'm stuck listening to Frank West's podcast throughout the game. This happens to be a bit of a big trend in games that's still going on, where you have the characters often monologuing to themselves or have another person to bounce off of. You've seen this in games such as Metal Gear Rising, The Last of Us, Shadows of the Damned. It's a trait that games in modern times have been using as of late, and I'm not knocking that. So long as the dialogue is natural, doesn't get on my nerves, and isn't full of one-liner punchlines that fall flat in their face, I don't have a problem with it. Guess what Dead Rising 4 does? Am I supposed to be intimidated by you maniacs? Because I am a little. Shut up! Shut up, please! Shut up! Please! Please! Shut up! And here's the thing about that. I wouldn't mind this. I really wouldn't. Aside from the sheer cringe factor of the lines themselves, it's not that far off what Frank West has done in Dead Rising Off the Record. There are two big differences though in that. In Off the Record, while Frank was sarcastic, it didn't impede on the story itself. What I mean is that while he made quips after defeating the psychopaths and people like TK who deserve such behavior, Throughout the rest of the game, Frank remained a level-head individual who treated other people with respect. He wasn't an asshole for the sake of being an asshole. Sadly, I can't extend to Dead Rising 4. Which is sad because at the beginning of the game, we're given a few traits of Frank that can make him be relatable or understanding. But as the story goes on from that point, it does whatever it can to make Frank out to be obnoxious and stupid as possible. And that's thanks to another character, Vic. To save you some time, the basic setup for the conflict is that Vic takes Frank to take pictures of a facility that has human experimentation going on. They learn that there are clones of zombies being made, and Frank just wants to get in and out to get the scoop. Meanwhile, Vic... I'm gonna burn this place to the ground. Oh yes, that would totally stop the human experimentation, especially when said building is filled with armed soldiers. They'll totally put the public eye in a place that'll be burned into being unrecognizable to investigation teams, right? Vic leaves Frank's ass behind and Frank is on the run because he's accused of assaulting soldiers. Months later, a unique animation that doesn't show up in the game ever again, the zombies are back in Willamette. And Brad Park, a ZDC agent who you were able to play as with Dead Rising 3's DLC, finds Frank and demands that he gets back into the zombie run town to find Vic and get a big scoop so he can redeem himself. Now, I know I'm generalizing the plot, but considering how basic the narrative is, I just want to focus on the biggest issue of the story to me, and that's Frank and Vic. Throughout the story, we get different signals from these characters. An example being Frank acting like a fun-loving asshole to someone who's willing to accuse Vic of stealing the scoop, meanwhile doing things that would actively hurt his chances of getting credible information, such as killing maniacs with attempting to talk them down. Willing to leave Darcy, one of the more annoying NPCs, to die and acting like an asshole to people for no goddamn reason. Oh, and making jokes when they're very inappropriate. Then you've got Vic, someone who's willing to get onto Frank's ass for- wait a minute. Vic, who's willing to chastise Frank for using people in order to get the scoop, but will turn around and sell a group of survivors to the same military faction who was in control of the military lab that she and Frank first broke into. So, she's a massive hypocrite, and as I alluded with the earlier section of Frank Rising, she actually gets out of the town while Frank dies for her. Look, let me be real with you. I hate the characters in this game. There's just so much stupid that one can take before they decide to say, you know, chucking my controller through the screen is a much better use of my time. And it wouldn't be so bad if the game didn't try to make it all more comedic. Whenever it tries to have a serious moment, the game, or more specifically Frank, will make a cringe-inducing comment that comes off as the developers going, No, wait! Don't take us serious! We're just having a laugh! This is something else I've noticed when it comes to games, where the developers will take the whole Marvel snark and put that into games, especially of those of Western companies. Look, I get it. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is popular. But I've really gotten tired of how much every character now has to be a snarky asshole. It ruins otherwise good scenes, makes it so I can't take anything being said seriously, and makes the characters unbearable since they begin to blend together in that regard. What was I talking about again? Oh, right. <sighs> I think I've established that I think this series had its highs and went on a very big low. 
But why is that? Well, as you no doubt have noticed, there were a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes of the studio in charge of the game. Capcom Vancouver. The original heads for this previous titles had left the company, including the writer of the previous games for Dead Rising 2, 3, and off the record, Annie Reed, before this game was even completed. And because of that, whatever was written at the time had to be written over. From what I heard, and by that I'm talking about Did You Know Gaming, which, by the way, looking at their sources, didn't give me a lot of credible information, so take this with a grain of salt, but because of the limited time constraints and people who left the company during development of the game, there were a lot of cut corners. And I can certainly buy that, since there are a lot of reused assets in the game, as well as copy and pasted locations with slight differences here and there. Regardless, the worst part of this is just how basic the game went, and how said developers basically lied to the faces of the fans, hyping up the game and flat out misleading people with the game's premise and such. Dead Rising 4! Not a good game. It's not a good Dead Rising game. I just don't like it. Obviously, that's just my opinion on the matter, because I know there's going to be a subsection of people on the net who do like it. But let me be upfront with this. If you like the game, good for you! You got some joy out of something I consider to be garbage. And besides, this was the game that had effectively killed off Dead Rising as a franchise. And that's sad. So... So sad. There is nothing good about this game. Excuse me? Editor's note. They animated the Servbot Mask. It's the greatest game there ever was. Well, I guess that works. Notice me, Senpai. Notice me. So, after that train wreck of Dead Rising 4, where are we? Well, we've basically got ourselves a dead franchise at this point. I mean, there were attempts at making a Dead Rising 5, so let's see what they had planned. Hmm, let's see. Oh, Chuck Green would be back as a playable character, and Katie would also return and have... Psychic powers. Okay then, never mind! Look, considering how Dead Rising 4 went and how it was botched so badly from the rest of the series, I doubt I would have liked the direction that 5 would have taken. I don't know what other people would think, but I would assume that there would be others that would agree with me on that. Regardless, it's amazing how a franchise, while not the greatest or biggest in the world, was still beloved by many and was slaughtered so callously. It is a shame. Dead Rising, while not my favorite game series, is a series that I do enjoy and love. It's been almost five years since the release of Dead Rising 4, and since then the series has gotten quiet. I don't know, when it comes to Capcom and their track record with games, it's hit or miss, as well as how they treat their properties. Resident Evil's been getting more and more traction, meanwhile Ace Attorney gets thrown to the side. Devil May Cry gets one of the better redemption stories from the cursed pachinko machines. And don't get me wrong, I have my issues with Capcom, and the Dead Rising games are one of the reasons why I have an issue with the game company. Dead Rising is a series that serves as a testament to how great things in gaming can turn into complete garbage. Removing features, taking away player choice, and worst of all, lying about the situation. This is the reason why I hate big time gaming, as they often will exploit their audiences, and will deliver products that are up to par to previous parts. I know that people will probably point towards things like Pokemon or Devil May Cry, DMC, and to an extent, yes, I can agree. But Dead Rising is the go-to example of shady business practices killing a franchise that I really enjoyed and grew alongside with. And to see the games that people who were given the reins of the franchise basically rip out the soul of it. And don't think I'm giving Capcom, the company, themselves a pass on this. I have no doubt in my mind, with how things were going with the creators of the series leaving the offices and teams, that there was some shady stuff going on behind it. But regardless, this video was a nice trek through the history of a franchise that I once adored and watched it crash and burn. Who knows, maybe there's a pachinko machine of Dead Rising out there. Certainly wouldn't surprise me. Regardless, while the franchise is pretty much dead and buried at this point, five years after Dead Rising 4 smashed into the ground, I still have the first few games in the series to go back to. So if you want my opinion, I think the first three titles, along with Off the Record, are at least worth your time. And considering they don't cost too much, it's something you guys may want to check out. I'm on a common. And thanks for watching. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would like to take a few moments to talk to you about this as the real me. This video was a labor of love, and I want to thank my editor Kaiser Trigger for his hard work with this. 
Without him, this video would have taken much longer and not be as polished, and there'd be a link to his channel down below, so be sure to give him some support. That being said, if you enjoyed these kinds of videos on my channel and want to see more, please consider supporting me in the following ways. While I do have a Patreon, I'm not going to shill and say, SUPPORT ME ON PATREON TO GET MORE CONTENT LIKE THIS! I consider Patreon to be more of a tip jar at this point, and if you want to support me through that, I'll still appreciate it. Now, if you really want to support me, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, hit the like button, and if possible, share this video around on various forms of social media. Twitter, Reddit, and share it in Discord groups if you want. It'll help get the video out there and tell me that you guys are liking the content that I've been creating as of late. With me moving away from drama and making more analytical and fun videos, this has been a fun exciting time for me to make these things. I found a passion and would love to see it flourish, and you guys can help out with that. And since hopefully by the time this video comes out we'll have hit 70k subs, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart that I appreciate all of you and I'm happy you guys are liking the direction that my channel is going. Or I at least hope you guys are liking which way the channel is going. Thanks again, sincerely, Manga Common.